So, um, so we, we talked about how, how to measure the performance, which is, um, so in, 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 in the setting that we are looking at, um, this corresponds to uh, measuring this sort of um, generalization error. Or, or, or the loss as we talked about it. Um, and so we want to prove that uh, if you have an estimator like the ERM, this loss, which is the prediction loss, converges to uh, the best possible. And so the, the difference is, is called the excess risk. So we want the excess risk to go to zero in probability. And we saw that, um, so if you look at the ERM, that's the empirical risk minimization. So without a constraint on, on the class of functions, this is not going to uh, work because you're going to um, have many solutions and, and they're going to overfit. So if we impose a um, condition um, that H belongs to some function class, and um, in that case, uh, usually you can't achieve the infimum here over all H. Um, but it's natural to ask that we achieve the infimum over all the edge in the function class. So what we get is um, uh, H star might not be in edge, uh, but there is the uh, H star sub H, which is the minimizer of LH over H. And then we can work with this excess loss or excess, excess risk relative to this um, target within the class. And if we call it like excess loss if you want, or estimation error, we can try to show that this goes to zero. And then there's this decomposition of the uh, excess risk, which is in terms of the excess risk of the, um, the restricted excess risk plus the approximation, which is the difference of the loss uh, to the, um, the, the loss of the function in the class versus the global optimum, right? So this is uh, how well the best in class can approximate the best overall. And so we leave this, this, uh, um, this term aside for now, we just analyze the first term. And um, the, the, the point is that if, if H is uh, too small, uh, you can always make this go to zero let's say if it has just a single element, but then this would be large. So you wanna um, provide conditions under which this goes to zero for a sufficiently rich class of functions. And then you would hope that this is small. You can later analyze this. This is a fairly separate mathematical problem. Um, or you can just assume that if the class is sufficiently large, it just star belongs to that class. And so this is gonna be zero. That's another way of dealing with it by, by assumption. Um, okay, questions? questions? Okay, so, and there's also the notion of packed learnability that we talked about. Uh, so we had this notation that there's the um, population loss, there's the empirical loss, and then we have the ERM, which is the minimizer uh, of the empirical loss. Um, and then we look at the excess risk of the empirical uh, risk minimizer. And so we had this result that for a finite class, um, if, if the loss is uh, B bounded, then uh, the excess risk, restricted excess risk of this ERM uh, estimator is gonna behave like um, basically, I'm gonna ignore the constants, it would be like root log cardinality of H divided by N. Okay, that's the um, how it scale. So if, if log H is, let's say it's small, um, like if it's constant, then definitely because this goes to zero, um, um, like it, it's probably that you can, uh, like for example, I can like take the delta even to be uh, like one over n if I want, and I get the log n here, log n divided by n still goes to zero. So it's probably that's going to zero. This is also, probably that's going to one, this is going to zero as well. Uh, even if the cardinality of H goes to infinity, uh, if it's slow enough, then, then you're fine. So the proof was using Huffington's inequality together with um, 
the uh, union bound. So sustained inequality says that the average of a bunch of bounded variables is concentrated near the expectation. Uh, we have this exponential concentration. And then the proof um, used this idea of a basic inequality. Okay, so we had um, this excess risk for a function, let's say h hat, that's the ERM. Uh, and then we added and subtract this, this term, which is non-negative by um, the assumptions of the ERM. So um, you remember this part, hopefully. And then we had this, that this is bounded by twice the, um, the supremum uh, of this difference. And this difference is um, basically um, the difference uh, of an empirical average from its expectation. So um, this quantity for a fixed edge um, um, is an example of an average minus the expectation of the average. Uh, the the Hoffman um, bound applies to it. So if you, if you go back, because it's an average, it's just an example of the Hoffman bound. So you have the Hoffman bound here, uh, and then you take a supremum over edge in that class. Um, and then this is the union bound. So you get two times cardinality of edge times that. And uh, then it follows that with, with probability of at least one minus delta. Uh, if, if I let the side to be less than or equal to delta, um, this less than or equal to delta, then I would get that this um, quantity here is, so you can, you can calculate T, and so T would be this, and you get the bound, which is probably you could get if you did that. Uh, and then twice that would be, if I multiply it by two, it would be a bound on the excess risk. Okay, so this was fairly straightforward. Okay, uh, questions, comments? No. Okay. Let me know if you have questions. Um, okay, so from this, we can extract a lemma from the proof if you, if you just follow the dimension, we actually proved this, that the excess risk, say one half the excess risk is bounded by the supremum or the class. And, um, uh, and, and we saw that if H is, is finite, basically we can control this by a union bound um, if you have uh, a tail bound and this for a fixed H. So the, the main point, basically the majority of the work in, 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 in um, Classical learning theory just focuses on, on trying to bound this quantity. Um, so if I define this loss class, which is the set of, so again, if you recall this LH of um, Z was L of H of X and Y basically. Um, so this is um, evaluating the loss. It, it has the loss and the function itself. So this is like a composition of the loss and the function. So if I define the class, the loss class, function class, L-O-H, to be the set of all these things, uh, L-H, as H varies in H, this gives me a new class of functions, usually from, um, uh, let's say X, uh, this is gonna be a subset of, it's gonna be a subset of uh, uh, functions from X to R, or R plus if you want. Um, so the function H itself is, uh, like x, capital X to y. Uh, where does the y? Yeah, I'm going to answer that. So h is this, and then um, remember the loss is from y uh, to y to let's say r or r plus. When I compose th things, um, it's just going to be a function from, sorry, it would be a function from um, subset of uh, all functions. Uh, from uh, x and uh, probably like y, this is the z space to r plus. So these are real value for non-negative value function. So then um, the problem reduces to basically supreme order this f. Uh, as, as h varies in h, l h varies in f. So we get the supremum over class f of this. So what we end up uh, having is something like one half e h h hat n is less than or equal to this. Um, and so I have to control this quantity for a general class. Uh, at that point, we just drop the fact that this has this decomposition, maybe this 
work with the general class. Um, then you can come back later and then tie tying things together. So where does the one half come from? Anyone remembers the one half here? Yeah. So if you follow this, um, unfortunately, I had the, I'm going to post the, the handwriting that I had. Uh, even even through this uh, argument. So if you um, recall again, I'm going to do it because it's uh, just simple. So L hat um, L hat n h hat is less than or equal to L hat n h s star h. This is the basic inequality, so called, in some literature. So this is true because um, uh, h hat is the, the optimal solution, the minimizer, and h s star h is just some feasible function. And so this holds. And so if you rearrange, uh, the difference is, is uh, non-negative, and I'm adding that, so I get a bigger thing. And then if you look at this part, um, basically uh, this and this, they're both bounded by, by the supremum here. So I get a two times the supremum. So you have this two here. I'm, I'm just multiplying both sides by one half. So one half the excess risk is bounded by that. Um, um, this is basically what we have there uh, as um, Ln minus L H. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so a different notation here, you have sort of a bunch of notations. Um, that's basically what we have there, uh, ln minus h. Okay, so we're going to focus now on controlling uh, these things. And this is um, related to controlling the supremum of empirical processes. Um, I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, but the focus will be on, on, on trying to bound quantities that look like this. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so how do we do this? There are a couple of techniques. Uh, one approach is to do discretization. This leads to the ideas of epsilon mass and metric entropy. And I'll talk about that later. Um, there is the empirical process theory, um, which leads to Radomacher averages. So the idea is to manipulate these uh, using some techniques like symmetrization, contraction, and inequality, concentration of um, um, empirical processes, and, and we'll get to that as well. There's another version which works for Boolean functions. So if the class is um, a class of binary functions, so let's say uh, I have z goes to, this is z, um, take the class. Z goes to zero, one. Um, and this, this is, um, uh, and for this class, we have the nice uh, notion of VC dimension. Uh, Vapnik, Sherwin, and yes, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so two guys who came up with this notion. Um, if it's a Boolean class, so for example, um, for binary classification uh, with uh, zero one loss, right? You call that um, the loss is defined as um, uh, indicator y not equal y tilde. So the loss is uh, binary valued. So if you look at the loss function class, uh, it's from the, like x cross y to zero one. So um, it's really um, suitable for an analyzing classification problems. So we're going to start with this, um, okay? And then uh, later on, we'll talk about the other techniques and try to relate them together. So do you guys have, like, did you, did any of you had uh, any exposure to VC dimension? Okay, a little bit. Um, online people, do you know about VC dimension? Anyone recalls what a VC dimension is? Oh uh, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that definitely. So, okay. Um, so um, before doing that, I'm gonna do an example because that would be helpful to understand uh, where these ideas come from. 
So assuming simple case where z1 up to zn are in R. So forget about the setup of like x cross y. It's just I'm going to control this supremum where zi's are iid uh, from some distribution in the real. Okay, so it could be like a Gaussian, it could be like a very uh, weird distribution. So I could have like, I don't know the distribution, right? So if I don't know the distribution, one, uh, if, if I don't want to impose any constraint on it, um, and then there's a, there's a, like a PDF, let's say, uh, and if there's no PDF, there's always going to be a CDF, right? So you'd have um, a CDF that maybe like goes this, this way. So this is the CDF. I can always approximate the CDF by a step function, uh, which corresponds to the empirical distribution. So um, I'll have uh, something like this, where the steps are at the locations x1, x2, x3. So if I have um, the sample, so um, the, the CDF would be the probability that Z is less than or equal to T. The empirical CDF would be one over N summation I from one to N indicator Z I less than or equal to T. So this is the CDF of the empirical distribution, if you want, if you recall. So F hat N is a good estimator of T. Um, it's like a step function, so it's not continuous. CDF of the original thing could be like the population CDF. Um, sometimes I refer to this as the population CDF. Um, this is as the empirical CDF. So population CDF might be um, continuous, but this is generally discontinuous, but it approaches the CDF. As I get more and more samples, these steps become, uh, get closer to each other and you get more refined approximation. Um, so if you look at this, this um, supremum that we define, and if you look at the class of functions that look like this, so the indicators of half intervals. So if I, if I plug in, for example, one F, so if F is, um, let's say F of Z is indicator minus one half T uh, and Z, this is saying one if Z is less than or equal to T. And so F of ZI is just uh, indicator ZI less than or equal to T. Uh, and if you compare with this uh, here, so you can see uh, this is just um, nothing but one over n summation i from one to n f of zi. Okay, and this is nothing but the expectation of f of let's say one of them z1. Okay, so um, comparing the uh, empirical CDF to the population CDF is equivalent to comparing this average, empirical average for this particular function um, to this uh, expectation. And so as I vary the functions, the function when I vary, by vary t, by varying t, so the levels. Um, when I vary t, basically this range is over all possible. So this is um, equal, if you think about it, to, um, to this guy, which is just the supremum over t. Um, uh, supremum over t in R. Uh, F N T minus F T. So um, as as F varies over this this function class with the class of indicators, um, I'm comparing basically the value of F N T for F T for all values of T. And I'm taking the supremum. So basically, um, this empirical process supremum is just a supremum of the deviation of the CDS. Um, and then the classical result is that this quantity converges in probability to zero for any distribution on R. There's no assumption. And, um, and in fact, like almost surely. Uh, this is called the Venko Cantelli result, and it's an example of the so called, um, like the classical uniform law of large numbers. And then the extensions, um, there are a lot of extensions and a lot of sort of uh, classical results or like developments follow from. Uh, this type of result. Um, so the, the, the class of functions that we have here for which this holds, the supremum, basically the supremum is going to zero. Um, this is called the Gilvenko-Kentelli class. So 
because length of Kent LD result basically says that the, the, the set of indicators of half intervals is a length of Kent LD test. Okay, so is the statement clear? So um, the fact that the empirical CDF converges to the population CDF uniformly in a, as an example of controlling these type of super, suprema. Um, and if I do this, uh, if, if I prove this, um, if you go back to this case, basically, uh, roughly what I'm saying is that if I'm, for example, doing uh, misclassification with binary loss and half intervals, let's say, um, then, uh, then excess risk goes to zero. So if, if I'm restricting myself to, um, uh, yeah, there's like a, you have to take care of why, but um, basically if, if I'm looking at all the functions that are, um, um, so let's say if I want to classify and I know that the points are like to one side is zero to the other side is one, I just don't know the location. Um, I'm going to pick the, um, the interval class uh, and then uh, the ERM would, would find like the best interval um, that separates these points. It's like a particular assumption on the structure of the classification problem. Question? How do you prove something like this? Any idea? So this supremum is not over a finite set, it's over the entire real line. Um, what is the first step in proving something like this? So I have, let's say for a fixed T, fixed T in R, um, can I get a bound on like a probabilistic bound on basically Z I less than or equal to T minus the expectation of um, indicator. Let's say Z1 less than T, or ZI, it could be ZI. Yeah. I from one to N. The probability that this is bigger than, let's say U, is less than is less than what? Yeah, it's an example of a half team inequality because these are, for a fixed T, this is a binary random variable. It's just basically a binomial minus this is what it's mean. So, and then um, the range is zero. So you get negative two, if you recall, let's go back up. Yeah, we're just gonna apply this with, with T equal to uh, one, All right? So V is one, so I'm gonna go there minus two and u squared, let's say, okay. So this holds for any fixed t and uh, for all u bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, that's the first step. Um, what is the next step? So I wanna take the supremum. Um, I wanna do a union bound basically. Um, so here's the tricky part where the ideas of EC dimension come in. So as I, um, as I vary T, um, so let's call this, if you want, um, I'm gonna call this, I don't know, WT. Okay, so the probability that WT is bigger than U is less than two E to the negative two N U squared. So the idea is that uh, WT as T varies in R, this is not infinitely many variables. They're just a finite bunch of variables. Um, and, and it's easy to see if you just imagine these, these points on a line. So this is a finite set. 
It's a finite set of variables. So I have, for example, Z1, Z2, Z3. It uh, doesn't have to be like uh, sequential. So Z5, Z3, I don't know, Zn, Z10, for example, something like that. Okay. So we have a bunch of these points. Um, and then I, I pick a T, um, and then this is the interval. Okay. Um, I have to make it because I want to count. So let's say there are just uh, four of them. Okay. So there are four Z1, Z3, Z2, Z4, let's say. Um, I'm going to pick an interval here. Uh, and so what this sum is doing is that summing over um, the indicator. So basically, um, the, indi the, the indicator is going to be one um, for these z's uh, and then not, not one for the other one. So the summation here, um, right, this summation is going to be uh, two, right? And uh, just counts how many of these points are in, in that uh, interval. If, if my interval is like this, Right, it would be three. And for any, like anything, any, uh, if I change the interval, for example, to this interval, uh, the, vari the random variable doesn't change. Okay, so if I, if I move the, the endpoint of the interval between Z3 and Z2, um, it, it would give me the same random variable, right? So um, that's a summation one zi less than or equal to t so this is uh t1 this is t2 uh i from one to uh t1 is exactly equal to summation zi less than or equal to t2 okay this is the same set of variables so for any basically for any t uh in let's say Z3 and Z2 in this case, uh, summation I from one to N, ZI less than or equal to T is basically indicator Z1 less than, or just um, you can say it's just the same variable. The same random variable. And, um, So you can see as I vary uh, t, how many of these different random variables will, ha will have? So how many, how many different, how many different v t uh, we have? Yeah, so exactly it would be n plus one. As, as I vary, so if t is below z1, that's empty, so it will be a zero variable. And then I pick, uh, if I move it here, I pick Z1, and then I, I pick Z3 and Z2 and Z4. And then after that, it's just like take everything. So um, they're exactly N plus one. Um, random variables here, right? And um, So does this number depends on like what values of Z I have? So if I change the arrangement of Z, do I get a different? If they overlap, yeah, so it gets smaller. Um, and so, but this is an upper bound. I can't get more than this. This is the worst case, basically. 
Okay, so um, what I want to argue is that um, uh, basically, so if, if you, if you want to like maybe write it formally, um, if I do, I can always do like um, to be a little bit more precise. What I would do is like order them, okay? This is the order of statistics. And so if T is between, for example, Z1 and Z2, uh, Z2 and Z3, this would be um, just uh, this would be two, for example. Okay, and if it's um, between um, yeah, so so the point is uh, there are. Um, there are this many. So when I do probability supremum over this bigger than u, t in R, um, I can do a union bound because they're at most n plus one of these variables. Uh, this times uh, the supremum uh, over t in R, that the probability one of them is bigger than u, and this is bounded by 2e to the negative n t squared, 2t squared. So the bound is n plus 1, 2e to the negative 2n t squared. That's like u, u squared. So it doesn't depend on t. Uh, and so if I take u to, to be, for example, uh, root like a constant, uh, what, what do I want to do? So let's say, um, for example, I'll take it to be, um, let's say I want this to be less than or equal to uh, n minus two. Uh, if it's n less than n minus two, then Borel can tell you also tells you that it's uh, almost surely converged. Uh, so if I wanted, I wanted to have that, um, let's just for simplicity, let's say n, yeah. Um, let's do this. This is bounded by, uh, let's say, 2n for simplicity, e to the negative n t u squared. Uh, and then I want this to be bounded by uh, 1 over n squared. Uh, so what I would, um, what do I get? Uh, I get e to the negative 2 n u squared less than 1 over 4 n to the third and take the log negative 2 n u squared is bigger than negative log 4 n 3. And so this is saying u squared has to be less than or equal to um, log 4 n 3 divided by um, 2 n, right? Or u less than root this. So what we end up proving is that uh, the probability that in the end, that's uh, just uh, Fn minus F in uh, infinity. Uh, Fn minus F infinity is bigger than root. Uh, this is like, I can forget about the four. Um, this is like further less than, it's enough if it's less than, um, Oh, right. So this is um, less than or equal to, and then I flip, this should be bigger than, right? So it's enough uh, if I, so you get rid of the four if you want, uh, enough to have u, let's say, be bigger than or equal to root log. I'm going to bound four by. Um, let's say, uh, I just want to get rid of four. 
Um, yeah, this is not necessary, but say log four n three is like log four plus three log n, right? And then log four is bounded by um, by what? It's like two log two. Let's say it's bounded by two. Um, log n, that's three log n, assuming that n is bigger than two. It's like five log n. Okay, if you did the calculation, I just, it's enough uh, to have five log n uh, divided by two n, right? So this is less than or equal to n to the negative two. This, this shows that it converges in probability and also converges in almost surely if you take that. With the Baruch Cantelli argument. Okay. Questions? So the main point was that the supremum over an, an, an uncountable set was reduced to supremum over a finite set uh, of random variables. And, um, And then this allows us to use the union map. So that's the idea of the VC dimension. So this class has VC dimension. So this set of half intervals has VC dimension one. Um, and so we're going to see. We're going to see that. Is, it, is the argument clear? Does it make sense to people? Questions? So the, the main point is that how many different subsets of um, the, uh, these random variables I'm going to see. Okay, so if, if this, uh, the, the collection of these intervals, just uh, let's say I'm looking at indicators of sets. So these sets are um, half, half open interval, like half infinite interval. Um, if, if the set of um, sets that I, that, that I consider would, would be like more complicated, then um, as I varied those sets, I could pick uh, many more different subsets of these. So I could like maybe pick Z2, but not these other things, uh, and Z3 and not other things. So in general, there are two to the N possible subsets. And I could, I could um, if the set, the set class was sufficiently rich, I could pick all of those. Uh, then I would get like two to the N here. Uh, and if it would be like this for all n, um, then I couldn't do the union one because I have an exponential um, decay here, but this is an exponential growth, um, and I, I wouldn't be able to sort of counter this. What we want is that at some point, this is less than 2 to the n, drops to a polynomial count. Uh, and that's basically the idea of the VC. So you don't want, um, so the terminology is that this set uh, shatters. Um, for example, um, I'll, I'll get to that. But you don't want to be able to pick all the possible subsets um, of, a, of a set of endpoints for all n. You want it to, at some point, lose some sort of fidelity. Um, OK, questions? Well, let me introduce the, the notion. Uh, so the idea is to use these. Um, I'm going to use some notation here. So let f be a class of Boolean functions. Um, and I'm using X here instead of Z for simplicity. You can imagine this is Z, but um, it's just some input domain. Um, Boolean here means uh, the output is either zero or one. And sometimes I'm gonna use this notation X one to N for just a generic set of uh, endpoints from X, okay? And then um, we're gonna look at the restriction of function F um, to, this subset. So this is a subset of X. Um, the restriction of a function just restricts a domain. Okay, so I'm going to just look at the domain, um, uh, or, or just 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 think of F as acting on this domain. Um, and and this this re restriction would be equivalent to just um, looking at these uh, n numbers. What is f of x one? What is f of x n? So the restriction of f two, uh, the subset can be viewed as a vector, a binary vector, and um, 
it's just both a function uh, and a binary vector. If you want. Um, and we also write this f, uh, this notation, f applied to x1 and 2 for this restriction. It's not f evaluated, but it's just restricted to x1 uh, to n. And so this is all the, these, these vectors as f varies in f. So this would be a subset of 0, 1 to the n, the binary cube. Okay, so these are some of the notations that I'm going to use. Um, so the main idea is, is this restriction. We're going to study the restrictions of a function class to a set of n points. And um, basically, uh, the complexity would be how many of, um, so, so how, many, how many possible functions are from, let's say, this to 0 to 1. So how many possible? functions from 0 to 1 to the n to 0 to 1. How many of these do we have? Sorry, not 0. Yeah. Uh, let's say from, um, I'm going to say from x1 to n. That's a subset of size n to 0 to 1. How many functions do we have here? So a function corresponds to like a vector like this, right? I could, I could set f of x, y to be 0 or 1, right? Um, this could take 0 or 1, and all the coordinates 0 or 1. So there are how many? 2 to the n. So there, uh, the answer is 2 to the n. There are 2 to the n. I want to see uh, how many functions uh, are in this restriction. Is it 2 to the n, or is it much smaller? So, um, so for example, from the, the, the one that we had there, let's say I have these points. Um, I'm looking at x1, 2, 4. This is four, uh, four, like a, a bunch of um, fixed set of four points. And the function class is, uh, indicator negative one to t as t goes in r. Okay, so when I restrict myself, so one of these functions would be um, the function that's sort of um, one here, right, and then drops to zero here. Okay, the restriction would be putting one here, one here, and zero, zero. So that's the, this vector. The other function would be like uh, a function that's zero here, like one here, and then just drops here to zero. Uh, okay. And so this one would have like one, 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 and zero, um, and so on. So, so e each one of these functions translates to a, like a binary vector for the restriction. I want to see how many of these. Um, and basically, the pattern that we recognize here is that they're exactly in, at most n plus one um, uh, restricted functions for, for this class uh, of uh, half open intervals or half, half infinite intervals. Okay, so the idea of restriction makes sense. So, okay, so if you, if you know said that, then the Navisi dimension is really simple. Uh, first, we, we define this. We say that the subset, let's say lambda, of x is shattered by this function class if um, the cardinality of this set of restricted functions. So this is how many uh, functions are uh, um, there if I restrict f to domain lambda. Uh, if, if if this is equal to two to the cardinality of lambda, which is the maximum possible, uh, then this set is shattered by f, okay? So for example, if you look at the set of intervals, if I have zero, like two, two points, right, x1 and x2, then um, this set is, so let's say lambda is um, x1, x2, by the set of intervals, this can be shattered because uh, one of the functions is this, the other one is this, and the other one, I can take this, and I can, uh, I can, I can pick, um, so let's say if I take this, um, this would be one, zero, uh, but I can also generate zero, one, okay, can I generate zero, one, actually? Oh. 
Can you generate? Uh, so I can generate uh, zero. So I can I can I can generate zero, uh, one zero, right? If I if I if my interval sort of includes this. Um, if I uh, I can I can generate one one, right? I can generate zero zero, right? If the interval doesn't contain it, um, again. So we have zero zero. Uh, one zero and one one. How about zero one? Can I generate zero one? Yeah, zero one is like I need an interval that uh, like half 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 interval to the like um, left that doesn't take x one but takes x two. You can't have it. Like if if, if I pick x two by this half open interval, I have to pick x one. So this one is not included. There are two to the two here, right? But the cardinal so here is like two to the two, but this is two to the like, this is not two to the two. This is three. I can just pick three of them. Uh, so it's strictly less than this. So this set is not shattered. A two point set is not shattered by the half intervals. Uh, if I have a single one, it's shattered. But two is not shattered, and three is not shattered. So no two point or um, larger set can be shattered by these half open intervals. Um, so the VC dimension of the set is that the, the cardinality of the largest set of endpoints that can be shattered by F. Uh, if, so if there exists a set of endpoints that, that can be shattered by F, then the VC dimension is at least N. Um, at some point, we can't find any, like if, if, if there isn't like the N plus one uh, for which um, uh, you can't, uh, um, yeah, basically, if there, if there, if there is, let, let, let's, let's just focus on this. So if there exists a um, set of endpoints that can be shattered by F, then uh, the VC dimension at least N. Okay. And then you go up, um, the largest N for which there exists a set of endpoints that can be shattered by F, that's the VC dimension, which means that if I go to N plus one, there is no N plus one point that can be shattered by F. And, and so if that's the case, then the VC dimension is at least uh, at most n. So that's that sort of the thing. So if, if there is a, an endpoint set that can be shattered by F, the VC dimension is at least n. If, if no n plus one point can be shattered by F, then the VC dimension is at most n. It's not n plus one. OK, is that, is that sort of clear? So it's like. Uh, you can, the VC dimension goes up as long as you can find uh, a set of that cardinality of points, one set is enough that can be shattered. And then you stop um, just before you get to the case where there's no set of, let's say, n plus one points that can be shattered. So what is the VC dimension of this class of half open intervals then? So there exists a um, set of uh, zero, like um, the empty set is uh, shattered. The set of all um, one points can be shattered. Uh, and we can't find any set of two points that can be shattered. So what is the VC dimension there? One, the VC dimension is one. It's like the last one for which you can find a set of points that can be shattered. Is it, is it clear? It's a fairly um, straightforward concept. Does that make sense? So the set of half open intervals is, like this, this half infinite intervals, so this VC dimension is one. If I, if I have closed intervals like uh, A and B, the indicators of A and B, um, the VC dimension would be two. Um, the reason is now I can take all the possible, um, all the possible subsets of a two point set, right? Um, I can take this, uh, I can, have the empty one, and then I can I can take this. Um, I can have both, so I get all of them like zero zero possible 
zero, one possible, one, zero possible, one, one is possible. So all, all possible um, basically functions restricted to this class. So all, all functions on x1 and x2, which is equivalent to all binary uh, sequences of length two can be uh, recovered or can be. Uh, so this, um, there uh, exists a two point set that can be shattered. Uh, there is a case where these are on top of each other, uh, but we don't have to worry about all, just there exists one. Um, and then no three point set and can be shattered. So in order to show this, I have to also show that no three point sets can be shattered. The best case would be if I have uh, something like this. Right, not the best case, but uh, you, you want three distinct points, right? So they can't be on top of each other because that would be two points. So three distinct points. Um, this, this, no three distinct points can be shattered, right? Yeah, okay, great. It's like really fun to come up with these. Uh, so this function cannot, like when you restrict this class of functions to the set, this, this function cannot be realized. Because if you pick x1 and x3, you have to also pick x2. The, the interval is convex. So, and that's be realized, this function. Does it make sense to people? Okay, another example is the set of all indicators of half planes in R2. This has VC dimension three. Uh, if you pick three points, um, I, can, I can find a half interval that separates them, let's say, to one side it's one, to the other side is zero. Uh, you can also like do this, you can pick both of these to be like zero and one. So uh, you can set, basically you can pick any, any subset, right? Um, I can set all of them or, or like none of them. So all the, two, all the pairs of subsets, like other, I, I can separate like every possible combination that you can imagine. So, um, Three point sets are shattered. Four point sets are not shattered. So, um, if the four point sets are in, in general position, which means that no two are collinear, uh, no three are collinear, then you have two two configurations. There are these two configurations, um, and in, in this configuration, um, if you look at this setting where this is the function that we can realize one one zero zero, if I have a hyperplane, I can have um, all the points to one side have to like take one value, all the points to the other side have to take another value. So however you think of this, you can sort of um, do this. So it's like the complexity of the hyperplane uh, class is not enough to, if I do this again, you, you want like have pure basically labels on both sides, uh, you can't have it. So you can do this with this and, and also with this one. Um, there's no way I can sort of separate. Uh, and like basically pick all possible subsets, uh, however you do it in magic. And then the case where they're not in general position, they're, 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 there are these cases that you have to also argue, which you can argue for yourself. So for example, it could be like this, okay? Uh, or they, they all can be on, on the same line. Um, you can also argue that you can't, sort of the hyperplane would be like the interval in this case, okay? So half of an interval. Um, so definitely it's like you can't you can pick this. And then similarly here. So you can argue for yourself that these, these uh, like singular cases in a sense um, are also. So no way, no way to arrange points, four points in, in, in the plane such that you can, this function class can pick all the possible uh, from like subsets of these points. Does it make sense? So we see the mission here. Yeah. Yeah. So the function class, when like applied to a set of endpoints, um, the size is as if it was smaller, right? When you look at it as restricted to endpoints, and that's what we care about because you observe endpoints, right? Uh, you don't, you you don't get to see the entire full function class. You just get it to see what what it does on endpoints. Um, uh, our training data. And um, if when you look restricted to the endpoints, uh, it looks as if it was like a much smaller class, then, then things would go through. 
that's the basic idea. Okay. Questions? Yeah. yeah, basically, it would be like equivalent to having just a finite bunch of. Um, the thing is, um, there's a little bit of trickiness here because uh, it's just not a, for a fixed set of points, you can have like a finite function class, but that finite function class changes if you change the points, right? So um, it's slightly uh, uh, like different than just having a finite function. It's a finite function class given the points, okay? But once you, once you change it, the, the size still is like finite, but it's a different set of functions potentially. Okay. Um, so here are some more, more examples you can do as an exercise. So pairs of intervals um, in the VC dimension would be four. If I have a pair, you can, you can see that I can sort of, um, I can just realize this as well. So I go to three and even, even more, I can go to four. So circle in R2 or is three rectangles with, with axis aligned rectangles are is four. Squares is three, and then rectangles who, who are not axis aligned is seven. So interesting. So polygons with k vertices is two to the k plus one. Half the spaces in RD are d plus one. Um, this was an example. So half the spaces in two is uh, two plus one. And there are examples where the VC dimension is infinite. Um, this set of all convex uh, polytopes where the number of vertices is not controlled, like polygons where the number of vertices, convex polygons where the number of vertices not controlled is infinite. Um, so um, there are, there, so the, the basically the classes for which the VC dimension is finite are small classes. And the ones for which the VC dimension is infinite are different, like diff difficult classes. So let's let's have some sort of um, idea. So you, you saw that, for example, this class uh, for which the VC dimension is one, the total number of uh, functions that can be picked when you restrict to a class, uh, like to an, an endpoint set is n plus one at most. So we want to gen like generalize that to, to any VC dimension. What is the maximum that this, this, this thing can, can be? So we know that uh, once you have a VC dimension, D and the set, uh, VC dimension, let's say N. So VC dimension D, but uh, uh, you have it on N points, and this can be two to the N. It has to be less than two to the N. But how, how small can, can it be? Like how much less than two to the N? Is it polynomial or is it like still exponential? It's, it's still exponential, it's not useful. But the, the remarkable thing is that once you can't shatter a set of N points, so once the VC dimension is less than and then this, this, this would be polynomial in N, not, not exponential in N anymore. That's the, the main sort of um, like uh, force behind the VC dimension. So once the VC dimension is finite, then these restricted classes grow polynomial in the size of the points, not exponential. So we want to prove that. Um, the, it's just based on, uh, the, the result is called Saur Shala. Uh, Lemma, but it just follows immediately from this other lemma, which is Pajor's lemma. This is from the HDP. That's the presentation that I have here is from HDP, if you're interested, the high dimensional probability book. So let, let F be a class of Boolean functions on a finite set X and define um, this S of F to be the sort of all uh, subset of X that can be shattered by F. Okay, all the possible subsets of um, this finite set X that can be shattered by F. Then the lemma says the cardinality of S, F is at most the cardinality of this set. So the number of functions in the class is at most the number of functions, the number of sets that can be shattered by, by F. Um, and the proof is by induction. So the, the case one is rather trivial. So if, um, not, not lambda, this is distributed x. Uh, we do it by induction on x. 
So if you're looking at a set which has a single point, um, then there are not there are not many sort of uh, subsets of this. There's just empty set and itself. Right? Uh, you have to worry a little bit about the empty set, but if we count the empty set here, so this side is either uh, so in most cases, it's just two. The other side is uh, at most two, right? So the empty set and, and, and so it's like there are two. There are two to the uh, one, just two, like the empty set and just x1. And um, just trivial, if you include empty set here. Uh, it would be like two less than two, something like that. Just just verify the the the, the um, base base case, and then we we um, prove that uh, if if you have like assume now like by induction, assume that you have the result for n points for any n point set. Basically, you want to prove it for any n plus one point set. So uh, suppose x is x one up to x n plus one. Um, it's like x one up to x n and x n plus one. And I, I know that the result holds for any um, endpoint set. So define these two subclasses. So the set of all f such that the f applied to the last point is either zero or one. So this defines two classes. So f zero, which is zero here, and then f one, which is one here. So all, all the functions that that uh, map x n plus one to one, we put in f one. All the ones that map f x n plus one to zero, we put it in f zero. And then we view these as restrictions of f two x uh, one to n. So these are now functions on. You can think of them as as uh, uh, functions on the first n points. Okay. Um, then I apply. So these are function classes on on the n point set. And by induction uh, hypothesis. Um, I know that uh, the cardinality of zero is bounded by the number of points that, that, that can be shattered by F zero, number of subsets of the end point set. And then similarly for the other one. Okay, this is the induction hypothesis. Then I would add uh, the two. So F is uh, the cardinality of the sum of the two. Okay, so that was the partition of, of the F. And this is bounded by, by this. This is just adding the two inequalities. And then we have this inequality, which is the key inequality here. Um, so the number of points that are shattered, the number of points from x1 to xn that's shattered by f0, plus the number of points that, that can be shattered by, sorry, this would be f1. Um, the kind of is, is less than or equal to the, the total number of points that can be shattered by f. Uh, so let's see why the last inequality holds. Um, any set that can be shattered by F0 and F1 is also shattered by F, okay? uh, because this is a further, these are further restrictions of F. Um, so, uh, but, but there is an issue uh, in which there could be one set that, that is shattered, one, like there could be some omega um, that's shattered by both. So omega, sorry, lambda subset X1 up to Xn. There is, there is a subset of X1 up to Xn that can be shattered by both F0 and F1. And this side counts it double, like we get, uh, we double count it on, on, on the left-hand side. Uh, but, but this other side doesn't count it as twice, it just counts it once. Um, but it counts some other set instead uh, that's not included in, in that. So for every lambda, uh, the set that, that, that's uh, the union of lambda and Xn plus one, this is gonna be also shattered by F. And so it's counted here, but this is, this is not something that's encountered here. Um, so why does it shatter? You can make all the combinations of like points from lambda. Um, by, by these functions, like by, by restriction, and then I can define it um, arbitrarily on, on this, like one and zero. 
So um, the um, can it get why why can I do that? Why can I why can I assign zero or one here arbitrarily? Yeah, but what, why? Um, so let's say, why basically have to argue that this set is not empty, sort of for? Right? So when I said um, zero, right uh, here, so even if it's empty, um, it should be fine. This is there's a little bit of a tricky thing because uh, yeah, so this this could be empty. Uh, let's say there's no, like F could be such that F of Xn plus one is uh, never zero, but then the rest should go through. But, but, but you're right. So you have to argue that um, because F zero can shatter all of these, right? Any, any set here. And if I said zero here, uh, then I can shatter all, all the things that, that uh, have it like arbitrary subs. Uh, a string of n zeros and one for, and then and zero at the end and another one like arbitrary string of zeros and one for the other one and one here just have to worry a little bit about the case where these are empty sets like f0 and f1 are empty um, but just think about it uh, should work out okay so the, the end result is that um, whenever we double count a set lambda on the left hand side here uh, we also include another set in addition to lambda on this side, which is not counted here. So you're always guaranteed to always be bigger than or equal to. And this is just the, 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 what we wanted to prove, the induction sort of conclusion. Okay. Sounds good. So it's a very interesting result. So it just says that the cardinality of a Boolean class is controlled by how many sets um, it can shatter. If you combine now, this is the main point. If you now combine with the notion of the VC dimension, so let F be a class of Boolean functions on an endpoint set X and VC dimension is B, then the cardinality of F is at most um, this sum. Uh, and then this sum is further bounded by um, uh, this. Is, yeah, the pencil is ran out of the battery. So it's bounded by this um, summation of um, intrudes k sort of binomial coefficients. And then the second inequality you can show using the Sterling's approximation. You can do it as an exercise. And the point here is that uh, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's exponential in D, but like polynomial in N. Okay, so it grows polynomial in the number of points. Um, and if E is fixed, like two, then the whole thing is just polynomial in N. So in general, the cardinality of F should be like two to the N. But if the VC dimension is D, it just uh, saturates and just can't, can't grow as fast. So the proof is very simple once you have the Pejora's lemma. The idea is that because of the VC dimension, um, so remember this, this SH is the set of all, um, so the set of all lambda subset X such that lambda is shattered by um, F. But by the definition of the VC dimension, once this is shattered by, this means that the cardinality has to be at least, at most D, right? Um, because the VC dimension is D. Otherwise, uh, if the cardinality is bigger like D plus one, then the VC dimension is at least D plus one. Okay, so that's, that's uh, that, that says that this, uh, this set is this sub set is, is kind of like bounded by like not bounded included in set and so the cardinality um, the cardinality of this is going to be um, bounded by uh, the cardinality of this other set. And this is just all the subsets of uh, a set of endpoints of uh, of size at most d, and that's just exactly 
just the combinatorial. And choose k is all the subsets of size k, and, and we're just counting all the subsets of size k, 0, 1, 2, up to k. So that's an immediate and sequence. So for example, uh, this is also another, another bound here is n plus 1 to the d. Uh, this is also a simple bound. This is slightly better uh, for larger d, but that's also another bound for, for the other side. And, and, and with this other bound, this is basically what we had. Um, if, if d is 1, you get n plus 1 for that. The interval class. Right? Okay, so we're out of time. Next time, <clears throat> I'm gonna just immediately have that immediate consequence of Sarah Shala uh, because you're effectively looking at a finite class. Uh, if you if you remember, you had the log the h, like the cardinality of h. So log cardinality of h would be basically the log um, cardinality here. So the log cardinality applied. Um, you get a result like this, which is. Uh, which is showing that if, if, if you have a Boolean loss and the DC dimension of the loss class is bounded by D, then um, there is excess risk is like D e log n over n. We're going to come back and sort of talk a little bit about this. So that's basically the basic idea is that finite DC classes, like classes with finite DC dimension are learnable. So packed learnable, or like a classic pack learnable. Questions? Okay, thank you guys. I'll see you next time.